when I think about every time we get together, and the we includes everybody who's here, even if this is your first time, when I think about what happens when we get together and we open our hearts to God and He comes in, it reminds me of the three statements that are really the heartbeat of this church because they really were the heartbeat of the ministry of Jesus. And here they are. Everyone's loved. Every day, in every day of ministry of Jesus' life, no matter who he encountered, no matter who came to him, no matter who he met as he walked along the way, they all somehow knew that they were never judged by him, but they were loved. It's why people flocked to him by the thousands. The second thing that became very obvious is that Jesus was the perfect sinless son of God living down here among those of us who are so broken, right? The contrast, the juxtaposition of the sinless son of God and the very broken people of humanity, the contrast was great and yet Jesus never condescended to anyone because he recognized that none of us is perfect. It's okay. When we come to church, we bring all of us here, right? Yeah, I think it's important that you didn't pack up whatever it is you're struggling with and hide it in the closet at home before you came. Because if God's going to deal with us, he needs to have all of us. And we all start from this wonderful recognition that none of us is perfect. And then if the story ended there, it wouldn't be so great. But the third thing that was very evident in Jesus' ministry and as part of the heartbeat of our church, and that is anything's possible with God, right? Yeah, yeah this is a song for the hurting. And I hope it helps you heal. Because every Sunday at New Life is a Sunday of healing for those of us who are hurting. So I want to welcome you to church, especially those of you who are brand new. My name is Ron. Uh, I'm the lead pastor of our church, and it's my privilege to teach us for the next few minutes out of the Bible, out of the teachings of Jesus, out of the teachings of his closest followers, uh, because they are the words that have most affected our world. And it's very clear that Jesus taught that his words came directly from God the Father. And when you get a message from God, is it a good idea to pay attention? What do you think? Yes. I think that's a great idea to pay attention when you get a message from God. So, we have just finished talking about the kingdom of Jesus, I think for nine straight weeks. And for the next four weeks, we're going to do the first installment of probably a year-long journey that we will take in um, intervals. Okay? And we're going to be taking a journey through a letter in the Bible called Ephesians. Now, the church in Ephesus is where this this letter gets its name. Ephesus was a city up in, well, it's very close to where Turkey and Greece meet today. Um, and Ephesus was a very prosperous town. And you might not realize it, if you, if you have a Bible background uh, or you've gone to church uh, very much, you probably know that the Apostle Paul traveled extensively around the Mediterranean world, starting churches, bunches of them. This church, the church in Ephesus, Paul spent more time with this church than probably any other church. He was there for a number of years. He knew them better than probably any other church. 
Now, another thing that makes this letter really interesting is when Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, there were lots of problems in that church. Um, I'll just give you one example. They got drunk at communion. Good idea, bad idea. Bad idea, right? You would think, who needs to write to a church and tell them not to get drunk at communion? But there is a portion of a letter in the Bible written to a church to correct that problem. Okay? So now, as you might guess, that was not the only problem in that church. They had a lot of problems. And so much of First and Second Corinthians is about solving problems in the church. The, church in, the churches in Galatia, which is, would be an area like Sonoma County, it wasn't a town or a single church. Galatia was a whole region and there were lots of churches in Galatia. And the letter to the Galatians that you read in Scripture, uh, the letter to the Romans, which was to a number of church, churches in the city of Rome, there were some real theological issues that Paul was having to deal with. So in Romans and Galatians, Paul gets pretty deep into the theological weeds. Now, they're great books to study. First and Second Corinthians are great books to study. But the church in Ephesus wasn't struggling with doctrinal issues and they weren't struggling with lots of problems in the church. So in this book, Paul lays out with greater clarity than any other of his other writings. He lays out very clearly what this life in Jesus is supposed to look like in real life. It's a beautiful unfolding of what we are calling the way of Jesus. And so for the next four weeks, we're going to, look, we're going to work our way through chapter one. There are six chapters in this book. And then we'll have a, a teaching series that's, that's really more about things that God wants to accomplish in our church uh, called Thrive. And that'll be a great teaching series. And then we'll come back to the book of Ephesians for a standalone teaching on Thanksgiving weekend. And then we'll do a whole Christmas series. And then we're going to launch a whole new ministry in our church called Impact in January. And then February, we'll come back to the book of Ephesians. So we're going to be working our way through this book over the next year to year and a half. And it's going to be called The Way of Jesus Every Time. And as we look at this, we are going to learn better how to follow Jesus and what that looks like in our lives or is supposed to look like in our lives. So why are we calling it the way of Jesus? <clears throat> well, we aren't the first ones to call it that. Take a look at the screen. Long before the followers of Jesus were called Christians, they were known as people of the way. You might not have known that, but that was the original name for the kingdom of Jesus. And it wasn't given to them by Jesus. This is what other people called the people we now call Christians. When they, when, to describe these people who followed Jesus, finally they just said, you know what? They're people of the way. It wasn't even necessarily a wonderful term. Why would they choose to call it the way? Well, let me give you a couple of examples and we'll get into that. Here, here is what um, the Bible records about Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul. Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest he requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any of the followers of what? The way he found there. Here's the second one. Paul was telling his own life story. And he said, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way. So here's how non-Christian people came up with that concept. 
the invitation that Jesus gave most often throughout the entirety of his ministry, he said in two words, follow me. And as people followed him, they began to live in a way that was so radically different from how anybody else lived, no matter what religion they were a part of, that people just began to refer to them as, oh yeah, they live according to the way. Take a look at the screen. Here's some revolutionary teachings that Jesus gave that truthfully, when you and I look at them, they don't look that revolutionary. And the reason they don't is because Jesus' effect on our world has been so profound that these seem almost normal now. But in Jesus' day and time, no one ever taught any of these. They were all brand new with Jesus. And they were so different. Okay? First of all, he gave us a different view of God. No religious teacher in the history of the world had ever postulated that God, any God, would be our Father. Brand new idea. It was so new, it seemed almost irreverent. God would be our Father? No, God's up there, God's powerful. We're little. God doesn't care about us. Our job is to please him. And Jesus came along and said, no, that's not who God is. God actually is our father. Secondly, a different view of ourselves. If God's our father, what does that make us? His children. No one had ever thought of people as being the children of God. I won't get into all the various world religions and so forth, but let me just suffice it to say, Christianity is the only religion in the world with a possible exception of one little branch of Judaism that would teach you that you are the child of God. There are religions that would teach you you are the slave of God, that you are owned by God, that your job is to serve God and to do the right things but that you would be the child of God. Revolutionary. A different view of others. If we are the children of God, what does that make us to each other? Brothers and sisters. Wow. A different view of nations and ethnicities. In the entire history of the world, other nations were simply people to be conquered and enslaved and taxed and used, and abused, if you wanted to. And the teachings of Jesus came along to teach that we are all children of God. Different expressions of God's amazing creative ability and personality. A different view of sinners. Oh my goodness. Sinners are not evil people to be persecuted and judged. Jesus came along and said, sinners are broken people who need to be loved to God. A different view of life. That life is not something you have here that if you live well enough, something good happens to you after you die. That life, even on this earth, was always designed to be a journey with your heavenly Father. Friends, that list, that's just a partial list. The teachings of Jesus were so revolutionary that people just said, oh, they're members of the way. It's just so different. Wow. Paul writes about this. And he admits it right up front. Take a look at what he wrote. We do not think of anyone as the world does. In the past, we even thought of Christ as the world thinks, but we no longer think of him in that way. Why? Because if anyone belongs to Christ, they are a new creation. The old things, the old way of thinking, it's gone. Everything 
is made new. Let's look at that verse one more time with a different part emphasized. We do not think of anyone as the world thinks. Let's just be straight up front. There is a common view of life in our world, and we won't get into a lot of that this morning, but the truth is Jesus came to give us a completely different view of life. And that's what makes him the most life-changing person ever to walk the face of the earth. Because it really flipped our view of life upside down. So that leads me to a really important question. How does the viewpoint of the way differ from the viewpoint of the world? Now, there's a long, long list, and I'm not going to go through the whole list. But as Paul takes pen in hand and begins to pen this letter to his friends in the church at Ephesus, he starts by contrasting the viewpoint of the world and the viewpoint of Jesus around the two concepts of behavior and identity. How are they related? And probably it's not a surprise that the world thinks of behavior and identity in one way and that Jesus came along and said, actually, they are related, but they're related in the exact opposite way that you might think. By the way, are both of those important for all of us? They are at the base level of what's most important to our human psyche. Okay? Let's first of all take a look at how the world connects them. The kingdoms of this world are based on a value system that says identity is earned on the basis of behavior. This is how it works at your job. You get a a job stocking shelves, and if you stock them well enough, and you're responsible enough, and you have a good attitude, you could become the aisle manager in your store. And if you do that well enough, if your behavior is good enough, then you might actually become a department manager. And if you manage that department well, okay, and, and, and your behavior is good enough, you might become a store manager, and then a regional manager, and then maybe a, eventually an executive vice president. And if you're really, really good, and you behave well enough, and you show enough promise, you might actually become the CEO. But they're all tied to one value system, and that is your identity is tied to your behavior. So you walk in, and you have a question. And who are you at this job? I'm the aisle manager. I'm I'm the department manager. I'm the district manager. That's your identity. And it's based around your behavior. And I'm not saying that's a terrible system. No, in fact, it allows us to operate uh, somewhat civically and civilly and logically. But there is something way deeper that Jesus wanted to talk about. Because the kingdom of Jesus is based on a value system that says our behavior grows out of our identity. Wow, that's totally different. To Jesus, it was fairly simple. He asked, I think Jesus probably asked this question, how will people know how to behave if they don't know who they are. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. If you don't know who you are, you have no idea how to behave. And so, Jesus sort of had this concept. Take a look. If you correct the identity problem, people's behavior will begin to change in order to match their new identity. Now, we're going to see this as we begin to read through this book, this letter of, to the Ephesians. And so here's how the letter begins. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. 
I am writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Now, I could preach a whole teaching just on that, right? There's a ton of stuff in there. But I want you to notice, how does he address these people? I'm writing to whom? God's holy people. Wow. That's their identity. That's who they are. We'll see in a minute how they got there. And he said, you are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. He goes on to say, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, that's who we are. That's what God has done for us and in us. And it's the message that he wants this church and every church to be declaring and proclaiming every time we meet. That we have been blessed by our Heavenly Father with unbelievable blessings in the heavenly realms. I'm not going to twist that to say, if you follow Jesus, he'll make you wealthy here. I know there are plenty of places that will teach you that, but I don't think that's good theology. That's not what Paul is saying here. He goes on to say, even before he made the world, God loved us. Can we just stop there? Do you realize God saw you before he made Adam and Eve? And that when God looked into your eyes, he loved you. Not just a little. He loved you. And no matter where you were born, when you were born, or whatever circumstances you were born under, that you didn't get to choose and I didn't get to choose, None of that has ever affected God's love for you. But notice what he chose about you. It goes on to say he loved us. Oops, we got to go back. He loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. I want to stop there. That's huge. Okay? Because in most churches, this is how that gets translated. He chose that you and I better be holy and we better be faultless or we're in trouble. Is that what he says here? No. Listen, if you miss everything else that I say this morning, you got to remember this. Holiness is something God creates in you, not something he demands from you. Do I need to say that again? Holiness is something God creates in you, not something he demands from you. He doesn't mean he doesn't care about your behavior. He does. But he's actually going to help you correct that. And he's going to create in you a holiness that will actually change how you behave But it doesn't start with you. It starts with you understanding something about yourself that you were created to be God's child. And working holiness into your life is his goal for you. And he will do it. Now he goes on to say this. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family. Hmm. That's huge. Again, revolutionary thought. Hard to grasp. Am I right? We're going to come back to that. He chose to adopt us (coughs) into his own family by bringing us to himself through Christ. 
This is what he wanted to do. Nobody twisted God's arm and said, you know, those people really need some help. Why don't you go adopt them? Really? Do I have to? Have you seen them recently? No, it's not that. God wanted to adopt us. Have you ever wanted to adopt a child? Even if you never did, have you ever looked at a child that looked so lost and so lonely and so alone that you looked at that child and you thought, man, I don't know how I'd do it, but man, I would take them into my home. I've thought that many times. Well, God has the ability to adopt us all. Isn't that great? Every single one of us. Now, I want you to understand this. And that is, a change in family brings a change in identity. If somebody adopts me... In this culture, you know what I get? I get a new last name. Correct? Yeah. I am officially adopted and in love. That family takes their family name and now puts their family name on me. You talk to anybody who's adopted, that's big. That's huge. Their home is now my home. Their food is now my food. Their sons and their daughters are now my brothers and sisters. Not my stepbrothers, not my foster brothers. They're my real brothers and my real sisters. This whole idea of adopting actually gives us a new identity. And over and over again, Paul is going to come back to this theme. And it is this theme that you and I have been adopted into the eternally royal family of all heaven and earth. Is that crazy? Friends, that's crazy. That we have been adopted into God's family. So Paul wraps up this section by saying this. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave us our sins. And he has showered us, his kindness on us, along with all wisdom and understanding. And the rest of the book will give us a lot of insight into what that wisdom and understanding is going to look like in real life. These new perspectives we have as we walk through this life hand in hand with our wonderful Father who has adopted us into his family. But now let's get real about this. That's all good. We can all talk about it. We all get it up here, maybe. But truthfully, it is difficult to grasp in any real way that we have been adopted by God. Anybody agree with that? It's hard. Why? I've been adopted by a father I can't see or touch. That's weird. That's hard. Imagine being adopted by an earthly father you couldn't see and, or touch. Would that be weird? And you would say, I just want to see you. I just want, I, I want to touch you. It's hard. We have a place at his table with our name on it. Did you know that? God has a wonderful table and you and I eventually are going to eat at that table in heaven. And he has a place at that table with your name on it already. He has an inheritance waiting for us. (coughs) Waiting for us. I don't know what it is. 
I know it's going to be good, though. I know it's going to, be beyond, going to be beyond anything you and I can imagine. And I know that our jaws are going to drop because when God is your dad and he's the creator of heaven and earth, what he has prepared for you is going to blow your mind. That's just the way it is. Not only that, I now represent him and my new family wherever I go. Can it be funny about that? Maybe a little funny. Okay. If you're going to honk at people and give them the one finger salute, please keep the fish off your bumper. (laughs) Does that make sense? Because the truth is, wherever you go, If you are a follower of Jesus, you represent the new family. I just want to, I want you to think about this for a minute. If somehow any one of us were adopted into the royal family of England and we got a new last name, right? And we're part of that family now. And everywhere we go, we're either a prince or a princess. And we represent the royal family. Would that be a big deal? Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, we've been adopted by a family way more important than that one. Yeah. So how do we grasp this? You and I get some help. And this is the real crux of this teaching. I want to point us to a verse in Scripture where God comes along. God knew that it was going to be hard for us to grasp that we had been adopted by Him. So take a look at what Paul writes. He says, you received God's Spirit when? When He adopted you as His own children. And now we call him Abba, Father. That was the Jewish expression for daddy, okay? And he's saying to us that God's desire is that we would have that father-child relationship that's tender and beautiful and that we would come to see God not as our eternal heavenly father out there, but our daddy the one who knows us best, the one who holds us in his hands, the one who protects us, the one who perhaps knows us better than anyone else and still loves us. Yeah. The one who is tender with us when we need to be treated tenderly. The one who sits down with us and says, hey, you and I need to have a talk. You ever have that talk with your parents? No. Did your parents ever have that talk with you? Yeah. He's that kind of dad to us. You and I need to talk. We got something we need to work on here. But it's all in a tender and kind and loving and, and there's no threat that I'm going to kick you out of my family if you don't shape up. It's not that. You're my child. We've got to work on this together. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. I want to talk about that, that phrase for just a couple of minutes. You have a spirit in you. The last couple of weeks, we've talked about this golden thread that runs through Scripture that says, you have been created in God's image. That there's somehow a chunk of God's Spirit in you. Now, the amazing thing is, that piece 
That, that, that spirit that God gave you actually has the ability to be communicated with by his spirit. I walked into this very room actually one day and the piano tuner was tuning um, this piano right behind me. And you might not know it, but a lot of notes on the piano actually have more than one string that make the sound. In fact, especially all the upper end notes, the high frequency notes, they actually have three different strings to produce that one sound. And when those strings are not perfectly in tune with each other, have you ever heard a honky tonk piano? That's literally what it sounds like. It's a terrible sound, unless you want honky tonk, obviously. So I said to the piano tuner, I said, man, how do you get those three strings perfectly in tune with each other? He said, Ron, that, that's actually simpler than you might imagine. He said, I deadened the two outside strings so they make no noise. And then I hit the hammer and I get the, cent the central string perfectly tuned to where it needs to be, to be the next step in, in the scale. And then he says, I undeaden one of the strings and I hit the hammer. And when both of those strings vibrate, if they're not perfectly in tune, there's an oscillation or a variance that you can hear. And he said, here, I'll show you. And he intentionally detuned one of those strings, hit the hammer, and you could hear that oscillation back and forth. And then he said, now watch what happens. And he took his, his uh, wrench and he brought that string back up and when he got it perfectly in tune with the other string, there was no more oscillation. There was one pure and beautiful sound. Now, I want you to read this passage. His spirit testifies, back one, Gus. His spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. God puts his spirit in you and then his own personal spirit comes and works on us until our spirit is perfectly in tune with his spirit. And what's the message it gives? When that happens, it teaches us that we are God's children. Now you have that spirit in you all the time. The first Sunday you came to this church, you had a question, is this a healthy place? And your spirit was on guard. Okay? And God's spirit was actually speaking to your spirit. And the fact that you came back or continue to come back, you realize somewhere in there, God's spirit is testifying with your spirit that this is a healthy place. And you became comfortable because you actually got a message from God's spirit in yours. Here's what I want us to do this week. I want us to sit with one thought. I have been adopted by God. And just to be up front, I know that's hard to grasp. Say that to God. God, I know. That's hard for me to keep in perspective all the time. And I fall out of tune with that reality. And I forget it but I want to live every day in the context of that reality. So God, would you help me today? Would you help your spirit to teach my spirit 
that I am your kid. Got it? That's big. You know why? Because when we get that, God begins to produce in us what I call royal behavior. And you know what royal behavior looks like? Well, fortunately, God tells us. Take a look. Paul wrote this. He says, when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It doesn't say when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will make us do these things. Or he will require this of us. No. He will produce this in us. And look at this royal behavior. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Would that be okay behavior for you? Would you settle for that? Of course. That's like the best of life. And when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and begins to message this to us, He begins to change us. A good friend of mine this week said to me, he said, Ron, if you had told me a year ago that I'd be going to a community group and it would be one of my favorite times in the entire week, perhaps rivaled only by Sunday morning, I would have looked at you and said, man, you are flipping crazy. And yet, I can't wait for my community group every week. His wife said to me, she said, Ron, do you realize that his life is changing radically? And he is a different guy than he used to be. And you know what she began to talk about? That stuff right there. Because the Holy Spirit, day by day, is changing him. Now we're going to take communion as we close this service. And as we get ready to take communion, you should have gotten a kit on the way in. If not, if you move to the back, we'll make sure that someone can get you a communion kit. I believe right outside the doors on your left, there, there is a basket where you can get a kit. In a very real way, communion is not just about the death of Jesus. It's actually about what the death of Jesus does in us. And we read it earlier. God adopted us when he brought us to himself through Christ Jesus. And the song that the worship band is going to sing over us and then invite us to join in and sing as we close our service. Listen to it. It's a song about identity. It says, I am who you say I am. And if you say I'm adopted, I'm in. I'm going to believe it. I'm going to accept that. And as we take communion this time, I want us to take it in the context of celebrating our adoption into the family of God through Jesus as the worship band plays and sings, I am who you say I am. God, as we take communion now, we do so in the context of affirming of having you affirm with our spirit that we are your children. Jesus, thank you for making that possible through your death. We bless you in your own great name. Amen.